Um, welcome back. I'm going to finish up your conceptual introduction to Markov Chain, Markov Chain Monte Carlo today. I'm going to look at a couple of examples of fitting models in STAN where the model is defined badly, and STAN gives us very clear indications of that, which, as I said last time, is one of the best features of STAN as a Markov Chain package. Um, when things go wrong, it is very obvious. Uh, this is indispensable. Uh, you want a good alarm. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of examples of that. If I have time, I'll also do an example of a case where, where something doesn't go wrong, nothing goes wrong, but I want to, we, now that we're using Marco Chain Monte Carlo to fit these models, this opens up a lot more options for the kinds of models we can make, uh, because we're no longer going to lean on the quadratic approximation, this gives us some freedom to do other stuff, and I want to show you uh, some, some, an example with choice of prior uh, that we couldn't have done before. Um, it gives us different kinds of shrinkage uh, or regularization. And then I want to spend uh, the rest of the time today talking about maximum entropy, which will be our conceptual introduction to uh, next week when we start to generalize linear models. Uh, it'll, be a set of, it'll be a set of principles that let us make intelligent choices there. So uh, I, when I left you, we were going to start with an example of a wild chain. Um, here's the setup. Imagine two observations, there are two data points. They have values minus one and one. That's the data, right? This is some anonymous outcome variable. And um, our goal is very simple. We'd like to estimate the mean and standard deviation uh, of these data, <laughs> right? The process generating these data. Uh, let's use, let's stick with uh, linear regression because it's all we have so far. Um, and setting it up in map to stand. Uh, first, I just make the vector y of data, put the stand model. What I want you to notice here is there's no priors, right? There are no priors in the model definition, and that means they're flat. Uh, they're this constant same value from minus infinity to positive infinity. That's what flat means. That's what it's meant with map. That's what it means in map to stand as well. If you omit the priors, they are by implication completely flat. They're always there. Uh, if you don't tell it to do something else, they are by implication flat. Uh, so we're going to estimate alpha and sigma. Uh, no surprises here how to do it. Um, we run it. I want you to look at the Precy output and ask yourself what has gone on uh, in these numbers. Uh, uh, this is completely predictable, or at least after I explain to you what's happened, you'll understand exactly. But clearly something's wrong, right? Uh, we, the data are minus 1 and 1. The mean is 0, right? You know the mean. So mu should be near 0. You could do this by your eyes, right? You don't need Bayesian updating to tell you that the mean of minus 1 and 1 is 0, right? So you could have done that ahead. Maybe you couldn't get the whole posterior distribution. That was the thing you'd get from this. But uh, you should know where the posterior mean is. It should be near 0. It is not uh, 4,584,496, right? which is what this particular posterior mean is. Um, and the standard deviation equally monstrous, right? And therefore, the highest posterior interval goes from uh, minus 7 million, is that what that is? Uh, minus 7 million to positive 7 million. So, or more than that, 70 million. Sorry. Uh, so, this is, something's wrong, right? You shouldn't publish these results. <laughs> uh, my advice. And uh, unless it's an Elsevier journal, and then they deserve it. But, <laughs> sorry, some of you know my opinion about Elsevier <laughs> as a publisher. But, uh, you notice you get also, if, if it weren't just that the marginal posterior description gives you a warning, the uh, number of effective samples is only 18 here. Uh, we drew um, uh, 10,000 samples, that's what 1E4 means, uh, and only 18 effectively, so something's wrong. And R hat is 1.1 uh, is substantially above 1. Uh, that this is, this is, it is, that's a big deal, that's a big di uh, difference, it's not converging. Um, what has gone wrong here? Let me show you the, what the trace plots look like for this model. Um, and you should run this yourself. I mean, uh, obviously, your trace plots won't be identical, but they'll look something like this. And uh, uh, there are two chains here, and one's plotted in blue and the other is plotted in orange. Um, they're not doing the same thing. In particular, one of these chains takes these wild tours out to very, positive, very uh, extreme numbers, far from zero. Look at the scale. Um, those are, you know minus 5 uh, times 10 to the 8th, right? These are uh, pretty far out, taking these really long jogs wandering around. That's for the mean, alpha, up there. Um, and then sigma down here, it can't go below 0, and that's what this baseline is, but it takes these occasional uh, uh, tours, long excursions up to really high values, right? This is 2 times 10 to the 11th. 
so that's where we're getting the 70 million uh, uh, confidence interval from. What is going on here? Uh, what's going on here is Stan is trying to do what you told it to do. You define the model, and in that model, there's there are flat priors, and there's not a lot of data, not a lot of information in the likelihood. Therefore, a lot of probability mass is way out in extreme values because you start with this prior that says anything is possible, including infinity. Uh, that's what flat means. Flat is flat forever, and you can quote me on that. And <laughs> uh, so when, there's, when the likelihood is not dominating, um, a Markov chain uh, sampler has got to sample out there at those extreme values to do the mission that you have given it. Its mission is to show you the whole posterior distribution, and it's trying to do that, which means it has to take these occasional jogs out to extreme places. Um, in, in this case, actually, there's a problem here is that this, this ends up being an improper posterior distribution because it doesn't integrate uh, to a constant uh, because of the flat priors. Uh, but this, it won't be hard to fix this. Um, all you got to do is do a little bit of regularization. So let me try to summarize for you what's going on here. The problem is the flat priors. Uh, flat is flat forever. There's not a lot of data, although you, are, you know where the mean is. Um, uh, as a consequence, most of the posterior probability is out in the extreme tails of the posterior distribution. And, and uh, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo system is cruising out there in this very flat space. The hockey puck keeps going, right? And or you think of in, in the King Monty example from Tuesday, the car just keeps driving. Uh, it doesn't reach a point where it needs to turn around yet because there's almost no curvature out there. And it's flat. Um, and as I said, in this case, the, the prior is actually improper, which is something you don't always have to avoid, but it's a good thing to avoid that because it, it will sometimes lead to problems like this. This is easy to fix. Let's just add some weakly informative priors. Uh, and this is a case where I can sort of show you how weak these are. I've been vaguely saying weak for a long time. Like, what does weak mean, Richard? Uh, now we'll get, it, it all, weak is always relative to the likelihood. Now we've got a case here where the likelihood is extremely weak itself. There's only two data points, right? And I'm asking you to estimate the mean and standard deviation of the Gaussian process generating them. Um, let's start with uh, the intercept centered on one, uh, which is the wrong answer. That's why I'm choosing it, right? Because the true mean is centered on zero here from these data uh, with a standard deviation of 10. And then we're going to put a Cauchy, which is a weakly regularizing prior for a scale parameter like sigma, uh, pushed up against zero, which is the minimum bound um, with a scale of one. I'm going to show you in a couple of slides what those priors look like and show you what, what the posterior looks like in comparison to them. Uh, before I do that, let me show you the code exactly as you'd expect. Uh, map to stand model fitting looks right now exactly like map model fitting because we're fitting the same kinds of models uh, we're just getting we're just uh, conditioning through a different algorithm um, put those in remember this is implicitly that Cauchy distribution is implicitly a half Cauchy because Sigma can't doesn't have any probability mass below zero it's got to be positive the scale parameter Stan is smart enough to figure that out when you, when you do that it'll truncate it um, and now, uh, look at these marginal posteriors. Uh, the posterior uh, mean for alpha is close enough to zero, uh, right? It's basically zero. Uh, it's a little bit above. Uh, that's, that's actually just basically Monte Carlo error, maybe a little bit of drift from the prior, but almost none. Um, and now the effective sample, uh, effective number of samples is high, and our hat is converged to one. Sigma uh, uh, at the right, at a good value to uh, posterior mean right around two. Um, Let's show you the trace plots. Uh, left is bad. If, you're, if your trace plots ever look like the left, you've got a problem, right? That is not what you want. Those two chains are not converging to the same uh, part of probability space, right? Uh, over here, the two chains are plotted in two colors, orange and blue, and they end up in the same stationary place. Right? That's what you want to see. Does that make sense? Uh, right is good, left is bad. Uh, and no sigma is taking these occasional jogs up, but now it's only going up to about 60, uh, rarely, uh, right? So I told you, the, the tails on the Cauchy are thick, so there is some probability mass way out there, but very little. And these, these is King Monty's car taking a, the occasional excursion out to visit, you know, someone who lives in the woods, and then they spend an uncomfortable week. <laughs> <laughs> the king and his entourage with somebody in the woods or something. And then they drive back to the city, and they spend the rest of the time, you know, hanging out with lobbyists. And stuff, but uh, so this is good. This is a good-looking chain. This is what you want to see. It's doing the job right. Um, and if we look at uh, 
contrast the prior to the posterior. These are these are sort of plots. Um, you know how to make these. You know how to plot density estimates for the posterior. You know how to sample from priors too, because you know the prior, right? You defined it, so you can simulate from a prior directly as well. And in your homework uh, for this week, I'm going to have you use SAM to simulate from priors without any likelihood in the model, so that you can do this for arbitrarily complicated priors too. Uh, so I'll, this is a good idea because you can see visually what the what the model has learned from the data, right? By contrasting the prior to the posterior. So on the left, we're looking at alpha. Uh, the prior was centered on one, uh, and the standard deviation 10 gives you this. Um, the posterior distribution very peaked around zero, right? Right over zero. It's moved over. Even with only two data points, that prior has had almost no effect at all on inference. There's no, no, only the slightest ghost of it left uh, in the quantitative effects here. Um, and likewise for sigma, uh, the prior is that uh, dashed curve. That's what the Cauchy 0, 1 scale looks like. Um, on the positive reals, and uh, posterior distribution in blue, uh, the median, uh, the, the means right around to the median, just a little bit below that, uh, which is the right estimate for, you know, calculate the standard deviation of minus one and one. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, this has done its job right. These priors have been overwhelmed. There's only two data points. That's how weak these are. Uh, incredibly weak. Uh, but the priors are essential in this case for actually getting the Markov chain to work. That's the lesson here. You can't do these things without priors anymore. You can get away with it with MAP. Most of the, almost all the models we've done so far in this course with MAP, you can leave the priors off and get the same answer. Right? I've just been trying to like train you like a dog to salivate up to this point. Uh, so when I ring the bell of fit a model, you think about priors. Right? And because uh, that's a good habit to get into. Uh, this is the case where it, it really is going to buy us something. Uh, now, of course, regularization is the other big deal. Um, Flat priors are never the best priors uh, because we expect overfitting and we can damp that down a bit. But here's a case where even if they don't do any real regularization, they just make they just make the estimate possible. Uh, uh, and this is a case where you could calculate the posterior analytically, uh, so you could check against that too. Okay, um, well, I should ask: Are there questions about this? Yeah. Katrina. So why would you want to have a prior where sigma is probably zero? Because bring you toward overfitting or overconfidence in your model if you're like guessing basically that the standard deviation is really small? Um, I, I think I understand the intuition behind what you're saying. So the idea, let me try to repeat it back to you and you tell me if I've, if I've got it. So the, the half Cauchy prior here has got a lot more probability um, up against zero. Zero is the most plausible value according to this. Uh, and that's true. Uh, and this does cause some shrinkage towards zero, uh, but not much. Most of the probability is in the tail of a Cauchy, which is why we're using a Cauchy here. The Cauchy tail goes on for a very long time. There's a lot of probability mass in it. So actually, most of the probability mass is way out there. Think of it this way. Cauchy's are deceptive when you look at them because they have no mean. Right? Let's say that again. They're deceptive when you look at them because they have no mean. And you're like, but wait, there's an average, right? No, there isn't. There is no average in a Cauchy process. Uh, and I think, I, did I explain this before about why this happens? It's if you sample from a Cauchy distribution over and over again, and you just keep calculating the mean, how much data you have, right? So let's take the first data point from a Cauchy, the mean is just that value. The second data point is the average of the first two. Third data point is the average of the first three, and so on. Just compute that running mean. Keep going. It will never converge to a stationary value. It'll just keep drifting forever, uh, forever. And that's the magic of the Cauchy distribution and why it's really an uninformative prior, in a sense. Even though you see, yeah, there's more mass on the low values, and it causes some shrinkage for zero, but very little. We're going to value that shrinkage a bit later when we do multi-level models, though, because then we're going to want some shrinkage, because that'll actually be conservative, because it'll push the varying effects towards not having an effect. Does that make sense? So I'm punting a bit here, but uh, anyway. Anyway, I, was resisting. I wasn't planning to go into the, the magic of Cauchy. Uh, same is true for the variance, right? It has no variance, and you're like, how can the distribution not have variance? Well, welcome to Bayes. This is where we love. The Cauchy distribution is very popular among Bayesian statisticians because uh, there's no sweat to work with it in Bayesian inference, but in classical frequency statistics, it's a nightmare because it has no, it has no sufficient statistics. So you're just screwed. Uh, you can't do anything in classical framework. So, um, so sometimes we use it just to annoy anti-Bayesians, but that's not my purpose here, actually. It's a good, there's a big literature on, uh, in simulation tests, uh, it has really good properties, uh, uh, both for model identification and regularization. 
Um, that said, an exponential here would work equally well. You can use an exponential. It works great, too. Okay. Are there other questions about this? No? Okay. Another example that's related. Um, let's look at a case where we deliberately make a model where there's an unidentified pair of parameters. So this is like the left leg, right leg thing, which you will reprise in your homework uh, this week. And uh, uh, so we define a model up here where the mean of a normal distribution is a sum of two intercepts, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Since there are an infinite number of combinations of those two parameters which can make the same sum, uh, you're going to get a long ridge. Those parameters are going to be highly correlated in the posterior. You're going to get a long ridge of plausible values, uh, all of which kind of hug the sum uh, that is the map estimate. Right? You remember this from way back weeks ago, right? before you got starved by the course in the meantime. But uh, So uh, same idea. Put it in here. I'm going to put a, a weekly regularizing prior, the same Cauchy prior on sigma, but I'm going to leave priors off of, of the intercepts uh, to prove the point about um, how hard it is to identify values. Uh, and why go through this example? You're thinking, I would never do this. Uh, you, you think you wouldn't. Uh, but I occasionally forget to do this. As your models get more complicated, you can make mistakes and slip up and do this without realizing it. It's pretty easy in complicated model structures to accidentally create situations where there are a sum of parameters that cannot be identified uniquely. Um, and this will happen by accident. So you want to see what's going on. There are other cases where uh, you just get strong correlations between them and you need some sort of regularization to help you get estimates and help the chain work. So I want to show you what this looks like when it goes awry. Again, the, the Precy output gives you good indication that something's up. Uh, those means look weird, uh, right? They're pretty big. They're pretty far from zero. And notice that they kind of sum to zero. Uh, <laughs> makes sense here because the data is the same data we had from before. Or rather, I've simulated it up there. A uh, 100, um, 100 values with mean of zero and standard deviation one. So the posterior mean should be about zero. The sum of A1 and A2 here is about zero. Uh, that's what sort of what's going on, these massive standard deviations. This is the kind of symptom of unidentified parameters. One effective parameter, one effective sample, right? And R hat is four, which is bad. So, I mean, I, I, I want you to worry about 1.1. Okay, so if it's at four, yeah, again, don't publish this. Not even in an Elsevier journal. <laughs> um, sorry, Elsevier, but you deserve it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, what's going on? Well, you might have a hint by now. This has to do with flat priors and having a lot of probability mass way out of the tails um, at implausible values. And, of course, this is a case where they're non identified. And we've collapsed back to the non-Bayesian case where without any prior information, there are an infinite number of sums. But what happens with a Markov chain when you do this is you get random walks, basically, through the posterior distribution. <coughs> Everything's so flat um, that, every, that the calculations break down. So and what I want to show you, you're looking at the trace plot. And there's two chains here in different colors. Uh, they're just doing kind of Brownian motion, definitely not converging. right? This is why R hat is 4. Because <laughs> our, our head is about them collapsing to the same stationary <laughs> spot in the probability space. Um, sigma mixes well only during adaptation. Right? So sometimes this will happen. And then, boom, as soon as you get out of that, it collapses too. Because now it's dependent upon the nonsense that's happening on the other parameters. right? Because you need, it's the joint probability that matters. So it messes up every parameter uh, in this case. That won't always be true. Sometimes some of your, some of your traces are fine uh, when others are broken. But... Uh, still, you shouldn't trust things like that. Um, so this is another bad chain. Uh, now, here's the thing I've been cautioning before. If you use bugs and jags, you can have perfectly good chains that still look like this. And that's one of the reasons I don't like to use those packages so much anymore. I mean, sometimes I have to because there are models you can fit in those you can't fit in Stan. Um, but uh, uh, the reason is because uh, Gibbs sampling and Metropolis Hastings can devolve to look kind of like a random walk, even when it's behaving well. Uh, so you don't get this alarm like you do here. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo should not look like this when it's working. This is an alarm bell. So if you are MCMCGLMM, if anybody here has used that package in R, it's a great package, uh, but it uses a combination of Gibbs sampling and slice sampling and some other samplers. And even when they're working fine, they can look like Brownian motion like this. And you're going to have to take like 500,000 samples and thin to every 50th. And someone here has done this madness, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you've had colleagues that have. Um, that's one of the reasons. It's a great package, uh, but it doesn't have these alarms like this. When Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does this, it's broken. 
uh, something's wrong and you need to fix it up. And usually putting a little bit more information in the priors is enough. Uh, sometimes you really have to fix the model otherwise. Um, uh, so here, uh, you can get this to behave reasonably well. Although the best thing, of course, is, and what you really should do, is remove one of these parameters, right? Let's, let's get that out of the way first. Uh, don't run this model. That's my advice. But uh, even if you do, or you feel like you have to, and there are model types where there are unidentifiable combinations, um, prior information helps you identify things. Uh, strictly speaking, in Bayesian inference, everything is identifiable because you can have prior information on the, the distribution of one of these parameters versus the other. And uh, in this case, we'll just give them the same weekly regularizing priors, um, run it again. Uh, now it's much better. Um, standard deviations are smaller. They still sum to zero. Uh, but now the chain converges. You get a bunch of effective samples. So it's reliable inference. R hats converge to one. Um, and the trace plots look great. Right? Uh, one thing you'll notice when you start playing with these yourself, and I encourage it, encourage you is to go in, uh, all this code's in the chapter too, run the bad version of this and the good version of this. The bad version runs slow too, and a lot slower than the good version. That's one of the symptoms of when you've done something wrong with sand, is it really chugs when you got, when you have uh, flat priors, it has to chug a lot. It's running a lot of, you know, Monty's car flying out to infinity. Uh, those simulations take a while. And uh, so one of the symptoms of something wrong is it, it goes really slow. It seems ab abnormally slow. The caveat here is that Stan is slowest during the adaptation because it's trying a bunch of experiments. So don't freak out if it's kind of slow during adaptation. Once it breaks into real sampling mode, it can move at a pretty fast, much faster clip. So uh, it isn't like it isn't like a lot of the other sampling strategies where it runs at the same rate throughout the whole process of the chain. It, it gets better as it picks up speed. Um, does this make sense? What's going on here? All right. Uh, so notice one thing you can do, you can extract the samples from this and you can re-identify uh, the actual intercept, right, by summing together the posterior distributions uh, and get, uh, uh, see that we have estimated the actual mean of the data, right? The actual mean of the data is 0 0.0075 and the posterior mean for alpha is just about exactly the same thing. Uh, but you've got to sum together the posterior distributions of the two parameters. Um, make sense? You guys with me? Yeah? I know this is not the most exciting statistical lesson in the world, but you have to get in there. The whole premise of this course is that uh, to do good applied statistics in a scientific context, you have to interact with the machine. And you can't pretend that there's just mathematic, mathematic going on in there, making everything come out right. Uh, and you shouldn't trust your machine, right? You don't trust your field assistants, so don't trust your machine. <laughs> and, uh, maybe you do trust your field assistants, in which case, stop. Trust your field assistants. Don't trust yourself either. Right. Uh, the universe is out to get you. <laughs> and uh, uh, the universe is hostile to inference, so it's an amazing we learn stuff, right? Yeah, question. One issue I've had going through this chapter is um, I had like first three or maybe five time steps look like a random walk and then it converges almost immediately. Mm. But it doesn't look like any of the examples in the book. So hmm. the plot itself is the actual convergence area is small because. Taking these big jumps at the very beginning, like during you mean the in the adaptation? Yeah. yeah, nothing that happens in adaptation affects inference. Uh, that's those samples don't get used. They are when you do extract samples, like on this slide, the adaptation steps are never in there. So that's the gray. Box. The gray part of it. Okay. Yeah, none of that is ever appearing in your posterior samples, and it doesn't appear in the Tracy table or anything. So the jumping is Stan trying to figure out the contour of the infinite hockey rink, multi-dimensional hockey rink in Hilbert space. Hilbert space, right? Uh, it's just, just the n-dimensional generalization of Euclidean space, right? And that's what we do statistics in most of the time. And uh, so, yeah, that's what it's doing. It's doing experiments, so it's perfectly normal. Uh, if that makes sense. It's a good question. I should have talked about that earlier. Um, okay. All right. I want to get to maximum entropy. So let's do this last example, and we'll get to maximum entropy. Let me show you something that. Two sorts, two models that work now. Uh, they have different priors, and these, these, both sets of these priors are perfectly fine, but they represent different kinds of prior information or different kinds <coughs> of skepticism about um, coefficients, about regression coefficients. And both of these are very commonly in use as regularizing priors, so I want to expose them to you and show you now that you have the Markov chain sampler, you can use any old prior you like within reason, as long as it's not flat. And, uh, and sometimes you'll want to. So, we're going to, I'm going to do this example in the context of the old foxes data. You remember the foxes, urban foxes, right? Good band name. Yeah. And uh, 
uh, or predict their weight using food and group size. You've seen these models before. The only thing that's different about these two models is the one on the left uses the regular old Gaussian priors we've been using so far to do uh, shrinkage or regularization on the regression coefficients. And on the right, I've replaced them with something called Laplace priors, named after uh, our, our hero Laplace, uh, one of the founders of, of Bayesian inference. And um, what does a Laplace prior look like? Um, a Laplace prior is also called a double exponential. I've, I've pictured one on the top here. Uh, the one that I put in here, this is centered at zero with a scale of one. Um, it it's, uh, uh, declines faster than a Gaussian one. I have a slide coming up where you get to compare them much more easily. Um, why would you want to use a prior like this? Uh, it amounts to a different kind of skepticism about the sizes of regression effects. So notice now that we've got a really sharp peak of prior probability at zero. Um, and, the, and it declines much more rapidly as you move away from zero than a Gaussian distribution does. And Gaussian distributions have this little shelf around zero, which is sort of like saying things near zero are pretty plausible. Uh, and then it starts to decline slowly, and then by the time it gets to the tails, things are highly Im Im impossible. What the Gaussian prior essentially does is create what's called uniform shrinkage uh, at all distances, uh, if your likelihood is Gaussian as well. But Laplace prior doesn't, because the Laplace prior is instead saying, Things really close to zero are probably actually zero. We expect a ton of stuff that's basically zero. Uh, and if something is really big and important, there'll be no shrinkage, in fact, because the tails get flat fast, because they decline exponentially. Um, and by the time you're out, you know, out here, there's almost no effect, unlike in the Gaussian. And let me show you. It's hard to see that, maybe. But let me show you what it looks like when it happens. To put it in a map to stand, there's this D Laplace, uh, which is the Laplace density. Um, it just looks like that. And that's a double exponential. You can think of it that way. It really is just two exponentials uh, in both directions. So um, just to show you, check to check your trace plots. Always check your trace plot. And uh, uh, everybody makes mistakes. And sometimes and you, the trace plot is not everything, but it's the first thing to check. These both look healthy, right? That's what I'm trying to show you. This is what you want to see. Uh, I was talking to someone this morning. Um, who had been running uh, a bunch of models in MC, MC, GLMM, and he was looking at one of my manuscripts where in the appendix we have trace plots like this. And he was like, he was like, when I read your appendix, that's when I decided I was going to start using SAN because I had never seen trace plots that looked so beautiful. And I was like, well, thank you. But you should thank the SAN team. Uh, they've done a tremendous amount of uh, tests on this code. I mean, there's more lines of test code in the SAN project than there is actual functioning code. That's how rigorous they are about making sure this stuff works. Uh, Really important uh, stuff, really reliable software. Um, and you get beautiful Hamiltonian traces like this, uh, which, yeah, you have to be a nerd like me to see the aesthetics in these things, maybe. But just like feel, you get warm fuzzies from this. Uh, nice stationary uh, trace plots like that. OK. Um, so let me show you what happens. Uh, so, so against the Fox's data, the Gaussian prior model on the top, on the bottom, we're only looking at the beta coefficient for the food, the average food available, predicting the fox's weight. Um, the priors are shown with the thin lines. So at the top, we've got that ye olde Gaussian prior, right, centered on zero. Um, it's at the same scale as this Laplace prior. And the posterior distribution is shown in blue. And uh, you may remember that you got a regression coefficient right around two, right? And it's been shrunk a little bit uh, from that because of the action of the prior in a little bit. Now, I've drawn this red line to help you compare the locations of the two posterior distributions. The Laplace prior, uh, you saw it before, it looks like that. It's like the tent, right? There's a tent pole right in the middle, and it's just drooping down. And notice that uh, the posterior distribution is has a higher posterior mean when you use the Laplace prior. And the reason is there was less regularization, because this is a pretty big effect. And it's further out um, in the tail of the Laplace prior uh, than it is in the Gaussian prior. The Gaussian prior has sucked it in. And the Gaussian prior will suck things in no matter how far out they are, actually. It can suck them in. Uh, the Laplace prior leaves big, powerful effects alone. Uh, but when you get close to zero, that's what I'm going to show you next, it doesn't leave them alone. And this relationship switches. So the lesson here is going to be, before I show you the contrast, Gaussian priors um, regularize things at all sizes. Um, when effects are big, Gaussian priors are more conservative than Laplace priors are. Because Laplace priors, if something's really powerful, it, it leaves it out there. But the opposite happens when the effect is weak. When the beta coefficient is estimated near zero, then the Laplace prior is more conservative. Well, let me show you what happens with that. I'll put it up here. 
All I've done here is I've randomly sampled half the Fox data. So now we have less, less power and the likelihood gets flatter. Uh, now watch what happens. We get more information from the prior. Um, now the relationship switches. Now the posterior median for the Laplace uh, model is to the left of the red line, right? But, I mean, the estimate has gone down, of course, because there's less information in the prior, I mean, in the likelihood, so the priors have had more influence. Um, but now this Laplace prior creates a posterior distribution, which I think you'll agree with me is not Gaussian. Right? <laughs> it's pretty pleasingly non-Gaussian, uh, which is what you can get now with the Markov chain sample. <laughs> Um, and it sucked it over so that the posterior median is almost exactly zero. And this is, people use, especially in machine learning, use Laplace priors for this reason. The idea is you have this uh, prior knowledge to expect or only care about big effects. If you only care about predictors that are strongly associated with the outcome, Laplace priors are a great way for, to find them. Because if anything, you tell, everything is weakly associated with the outcome, always, in every data set, right? Nothing is ever has a beta coefficient of exactly zero. Uh, even if it's in truth that, simulate some data, you'll never get it, get it to be exactly zero. There's always an association. The Laplace prior says things close to zero are probably actually zero, uh, and it tends to suck them right up to it. So regularization is strong for small effects and very weak for big effects. Um, so you don't have to understand all the details of this, uh, but I wanted to expose, it, expose you to it at some point. Um, this also has an effect on... Let's, let's reprise the effective number of parameters in these models and think about how that matters here, too. Uh, so uh, map to stand will also calculate WAIC by default for you uh, when these things come out. And uh, so we can look at P sub D, the effective, or uh, that should be P sub WAIC. Anyway, it's the effective number of parameters uh, for each model. Um, here's the story I want to tell. We're going to start by going down this table and look at uh, the effective number of parameters and then what happens in WAIC at the end. Um, Laplace priors are more flexible as long as the effects are big, right? Unless the likelihood is near zero. The consequence of this is that the P, the effective number of parameters, is typically greater when you lose, use Laplace priors than when you use Gaussian priors, right? And we see that in the first two models we fit with all the data. Uh, about three parameters, a little more than three effective parameters, which I think is the actual number, maybe. No, it's less than that, right? Because we've done some regularization. Um, and almost four for the Laplace model. And that's, that's because the likelihood ended up in an area where the prior is really flat, and so it was able to slide around flexibly. And that's what it is. The, you get more variation in the posterior distribution out there, less regularization. The model is more flexible. It can encode the sample better with the Laplace priors. Um, but when we use only half the data, now Laplace is aggressively regularizing because the effect gets close to zero. And now they had, that's the bottom two models I'm showing here. Now they have effectively the same flexibility, the same number of effective parameters. So it's a, the effective number of parameters is a function both of the data and the model, uh, right, and all the, all the interaction of them, because uh, it's measuring, you know, as I joked before, the squishiness of the posterior distribution. It's a, it's a measure, a theoretically uh, principled measure of the overfitting risk that arises from the flexibility in the model to fit the sample. Uh, and it, it, there can be complex interactions like this. And I wanted to show you an example like this so that well, I'm being honest with you. This is how it is. This is the reality of model fitting. Um, so Laplace flits, fits the sample better uh, if we're, when we use all the data because it's more flexible. Um, but notice that the WIC values are almost identical, right? You should never get excited about a difference of 0.7 or whatever that is. I'd never, ever get excited about that. That's less than one data point, right? And uh, uh, But they're expected to overfit more because of PD, and being bigger, and so in WAIC, they're basically the same as a consequence of two, right? There's two, two aspects to overfitting. And uh, uh, with the Gaussian prior, one way you can think about this is you expect many small effects with a Gaussian prior, because there's this kind of area near zero, uh, which has similar prior probability, right? Uh, whereas with a Laplace prior, you can think of it as you expect a few important effects and lots of things basically zero. Um, so it'll leave, if you get really strong evidence that some predictor is strongly associated with the outcome, Laplace priors leave it alone and do almost nothing to it. So they're popular in machine learning. Questions? I know this is bound to be a little mystical. I'm just trying to broaden your horizons here uh, about this and you'll see these things come up. The Laplace prior is used a ton um, in machine learning all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, the, the question was, this is an open question, but when would you use this? We need some domain knowledge. I mean, I've, I've tried with the, the bottom two bullet points on this slide to give you an idea. Do you expect uh, lots of small things to cause the outcome? Or do you instead have some prior theory which tells you only one or two of these things are actually associated with the outcome and the rest are just pretenders? Uh, in that case, use a little plus prior, I would say. That's the best I can do on horoscopic advice, I think. Uh, but that's the usual way you think about it, is uh, a priori we expect or only care about things that are strongly associated with the outcome. Laplace priors will give you the subset of predictors like that. Okay. Um, but if instead, like in biology and the social sciences, things are caused by a million things, uh, and you care about them all, then Gaussian priors may make a lot more sense. Uh, but it depends. It, I mean, all models are false, so discovering the truth should probably not be our mission here. Right, uh, it's a question of practically what you're pragmatically what you're going to do with the model once you get it. Uh, if you're looking for the most important thing, Laplace priors could make sense even if the background theory says lots of things matter. Uh, that's a common issue, right? So, like in marketing research, Laplace priors are reasonably uh, popular because they're only looking for the things they can use to best manipulate us, right? <laughs> Those are the things that they can you know, get contracts on and stuff. It sounds dark, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. It's dark. There's darkness that way. <laughs> but, Anyway, uh, uh, we're not done yet, but we're at the point of, of the end of material relevant to doing your homework uh, for this week. So homework's already up. Please take a look. There are three problems. The first two are practice with getting used to Markov chains. I've designed some hopefully interesting and educational uh, pair of problems to get you used to running stand uh, and to force you to actually install it. I know some of you haven't, haven't yet, right? Yeah, it's bad. Uh, so uh, do so. Um, and uh, the third problem, you're going to analyze the uh, judgment of Princeton line data that I introduced last week. Um, and uh, have fun with it. it I've left it open-ended because you guys are rock stars now, right? And you're going uh, to do a great job with it. Uh, but there's, it's an interaction. You're going to practice interactions and lots of other things with it and try to figure out what's going on. Um, understand the mind of a Belgian judge. That's, that's, that's your goal. Can we get New Jersey line? I, that's a good question. Does anybody know if we can get New Jersey wine in California? Uh, it seems seems like I could be fired for even uttering that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I bet New Jersey wine is fine. Uh, at least once you're drunk, I bet it's great. <laughs> so, yeah, drink some Jersey wine. If someone can find some, uh, let me know. I'll buy a box and we can, you know, <laughs> after the class ends, we can have a tasting session or something. But... Um, I'm game. I mean, I'm an anthropologist. I have to consume anything someone puts in front of me. It's like, it's an obli a disciplinary obligation, right? Roasted grubs, anything you like, I will eat it. So, um, all right, let's shift gears now. Uh, this is, this is, uh, well, I mean, I'll tell you what it is once I get through the intro. Okay, imagine uh, we have five buckets uh, on the ground. It's a thought experiment. And they're arranged so that they're equally distant from you, and you're standing uh, in front of a pile of 100 pebbles. And I know there's only 11 pictures here, but I got tired of copying and pasting, so that's why there's only 11. And uh, imagine there's 100. There's a large number of pebbles. And you're going to stand, and you're going to pick up a pebble one at a time, and you're going to throw them into the buckets. Uh, and since this is a thought experiment, I can assert that you will always land one in a bucket, and each bucket is equally likely for each, any particular pebble is equally likely to land in any of the buckets. Okay? So I'll repeat this. We've got 100 pebbles. We're going to throw each one. Each pebble has an equal chance of landing in any of the five buckets. Okay? We're going to throw them all, all 100 pebbles, into the buckets. Um, right? Throw them all in there. And what could happen? Well, there could be a bunch of distributions of pebbles across buckets. Right? So we're going to, we're going to count them up. Lots of things could happen. There are extreme cases. We could get all 100 buckets in the same, all 100 buckets, all 100 pebbles in the same bucket. Right? Unlikely, but it could happen. Yeah? Uh, if we do this exercise enough times, it'll happen eventually. Uh, uh, the sun will probably go supernova before it happens, but uh, it might happen. Uh, and this could happen to any of the buckets, right? There, there are five ways to get all the pebbles in any one particular bucket. Um, much more likely is some mixture across the buckets. Uh, here's an example. You get 5, 22, 12, 37, 24 in each of the buckets, uh, respectively. And a very large number of different distributions are possible here. Huge number. Uh, we can calculate it, in fact. So if you're from 
combinatorics. Uh, we're not going to do that, but we are going to be interested in the combinatorics of this problem. Why? Because this is the foundation of statistics before you. Uh, think back to week one where we drew marbles from a bag and we talked about the garden of forking data. Remember the whole premise behind Bayesian inferences. According to our theory, we count up all the ways the data could arise according to our assumptions. And absent any other information which lets us discount the relative plausibilities of the, of the different conjectures that could have produced the data, the conjecture that has the most ways to produce the data is the most plausible. And posterior distributions simply rank parameter values, combinations of parameters that way. Combinations of parameters are conjectures about the machine producing the data. Uh, and posterior distribution, probability theory is just summing up possibilities. It's convenient calculus for summing over all the stuff in the garden of working data. Um, uh, we're gonna, uh, this is another thought experiment along the same lines. And let me, let me keep with it so you can see where we're going here. Um, so let's say, in general, we're going to make these symbols N1, N2, N3, N4, N5 for the numbers of pebbles that land in each bucket. Uh, and then... Given any distribution of pebbles across the buckets can be characterized with these numbers. Are you with me? Right? A bunch of different distributions, but each of them can be characterized completely by specific values assigned to N1 through N5. Uh, for any one of those distributions, there's an easy way to count up how many ways it could happen. And what I mean is, uh, think about in the distribution I just had up there. I'll go back to it. Um, there are a bunch of ways to get this distribution because the individual identities of the pebbles don't matter. Right, so I had numbered the pebbles on the first slide. So imagine they're, they're still numbered. It does, I could take one pebble from bucket one and put it in bucket two and take one, bucket, one pebble from bucket two and put it in bucket one. It's still the same distribution, but it's another way to get it. Right? You see that? There will be a large number of different arrangements of the pebbles, the individual unique snowflakes of pebbles. Uh, these were like the marbles in the bag before. Right? Uh, if all you're doing is counting their color, then there are different ways to get the same data. If here all we're doing is counting the numbers of pebbles in each bucket, there are a bunch of different ways to get the same distribution. You with me? I, I appreciate that this is very abstract, and, and Roshan is looking at me like, okay, I'm, I'm with you, but you better get to the point soon, Richard. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I appreciate that. That is a reasonable reaction. Uh, <laughs> however, we've got a ways to go through the woods still. So, <laughs> but, uh, okay. So... We can calculate this for combinatorics. Sometime in secondary school, you learn the following, right? And then you probably blacked out when you reach the <laughs> age and forgot all about it. But uh, uh, this is the multinomial chooser, uh, sometimes called the multiplicity. It is W here is the number of ways to get the distribution uh, defined by N1 through N5, where capital N is the sum of them all. It's 100 in this case, right? The total number of the... So 100 factorial divided by the product of n1 factorial, n2 factorial, n3 factorial, n4 factorial, n5 factorial. That's the number of distinct arrangements of the pebbles that will give you the same distribution. You with me? Okay. So that's what we want. That's the number of ways. It's often called the multiplicity in combinatorics, the multiplicity uh, of the distribution. So let's think about different distributions. And now to make it cognitively easy, let's imagine you only have 10 pebbles. Uh, otherwise, there's to keep the numbers under control. Otherwise, my slide's not big enough to hold the number of ways uh, that you can get these distributions. So let's start with a very unlikely distribution. All 10 pebbles land in bucket three. Right? If you were trying to do this, you could probably do it. I believe in you. But uh, remember, we're, we've defined by assertion for the thought experiment that it's random uh, across the buckets, equal chance. There's exactly one way for this to happen. Right? All of the 10 pebbles have to land in there. They can't be in any of the other buckets. So there's one unique way for this to happen. That's intuitive, right? You didn't need combinatorics to tell you that. Uh, agreed? Yeah? Let's imagine taking two pebbles from that and putting them in buckets two and four now. So now, before I reveal the answer to you, uh, just think to yourselves, uh, or you're, you're free to blurt it out if you're really good at combinatorics, uh, how many ways are there to get this distribution? Think about it for a second. Like, and you think about it like, how, how many more? There was one before exactly. Now, how many for this? And just think about it for a second. If you're good at factorials, you've already got the answer, right? You're like chugging in your head. I can see Trina's doing this, right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, think about it for a second. The answer is 90. There are 90 ways to get this. Because there are a lot of pebbles. Well, there are only 10 pebbles, but there's all these arrangements. We can swap the pebbles in 2 and 4 is the first one, right? And then we take either one of those and swap it with a pebble in bucket 3. 
And then we could also swap the pebble in bucket four with one in bucket three. And there are all these swaps you can do, and there are 90 such arrangements uh, to produce it. This is the wonder of combinatorics, right? Again, I'm in the nerdy aesthetic area of this stuff. But um, let's keep going with this thought experiment. Let's take two more uh, pebbles out of bucket three and put them in buckets two and four. Question. Yeah. Does that mean that the third, if the third pebble in the second example there, if it were picked and was the fifth, basically it's not just about bucket, it's about the, which one it was in the bucket, right? Like if it were picked the first time in three and then the fifth time in three, then it would be considered the pebble. I had not followed that, so there was a whole lot of bucket in it. <laughs> Well, it's not about the different 90 ways. It's not so about which bucket it's in. So it doesn't right. ever matter. Yeah. So we have the identity of the actual pebble itself. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's the identity of the pebble. Also. Okay. Is that what your question was? Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's arrangements of pebbles in the buckets. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we could shift this distribution over so that we were in buckets one, two, and three, and there would also be 90 ways to do that. Right. That that would also be true. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's consider. We take two more pebbles out of the middle bucket. Put them in buckets two and four. How many ways to do this? Same idea. Think about it. Okay, we went from one to 90. How big are we going to go now? Think. Simple rearrangement of just a couple pebbles. Uh, the answer is 1,260 ways. Uh, this is the wonder of combinatorics. This is the wonder of factorials, right? <laughs> uh, they, they escalate uh, pretty rapidly. Lots of ways, lots of arrangements, huge numbers of ways. Uh, let's keep going. Because I am going someplace. Trust me, you're going to learn something from this. Uh, hopefully that you would like. Um, now let's take, again, two more out of the middle. Put them in the end now. This is the flattest distribution we've seen so far. Uh, how many ways to get this? Again, I, I asked you to inspect your intuition. We went from 1 to 90 to 1,260. What do you think this is going to be? 20 times more? Say, we've got a bid. 20 times more. We should have a <laughs> raffle <laughs> here. There's no reason your intuition should be good at this, by the way. This is, this is not a human skill. Uh, the answer is uh, 20 times is a pretty good, is pretty close. Uh, 37,800 ways to get this distribution. If we took two more yet from the middle and put them on the end, get the perfectly flat distribution, which is the, the next distribution we're going to think about, there are uh, 113,400 ways get that distribution. And this is the distribution with the greatest number of unique arrangements of pebbles uh, that can produce it. And I'll say that again. This is the distribution, the distribution with two pebbles in every bucket. This is the distribution with the greatest multiplicity, the greatest number of ways it can be realized, uh, right, of all the others. So now I ask you, we've done this experiment, or uh, and, and you haven't counted up in the bucket yet, and I want you to bet on a distribution. What distribution do you bet on? You bet on this one. You better bet on this one because you have no other information. This is your best bet. It, the number of ways you can get this distribution dwarfs every other distribution. Even the ones arbitrarily similar to it have order of magnitude fewer ways to arise. Uh, right? We went from 37,000 to 113,000. Right? And as the number of pebbles goes up, the distances between these distributions gets bigger and bigger as well. By the time you're up to 100, I first did this, these calculations for 100, and I was like, oh my god, these numbers are too big uh, <laughs> to think about, right? And I wanted to do this kind of like guessing game, too, so you're still within the realm of numbers you're comfortable with, right? And uh, it escalates, um, and then because of the combinatorics. So, uh, again, it absent any other information, uh, uh, Tez has just thrown a, a thousand pebbles into buckets, and he's very skilled at this, and uh, then I ask you guys to bet you know, given no other information, what distribution do you think has arisen? Bet on the one that, that can arise the most number of ways. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, though. All of these distributions, all of the unique distributions defined by the independent arrangements of pebbles are equally likely. I'll say that again. Every distribution defined by a unique arrangement of the individual identified pebbles is equally likely because every pebble is independent of every other pebble. There's a bunch of distributions that can arise from this random throwing process. Um, but some of them, the little micro states, that is the arrangements of the pebbles, make the same macro state, that is distribution. And some of those macro states, distributions, have many, many more ways to arise than others. And those are the ones we bet on in probability theory. And that's the whole essence of probability theory. It really is that stupid. It really is. And it's also that awesome. Uh, we use 
this is defined, given the information you have available, you define how the tossing works, right? And given that, you count up all the ways particular things, macro states of the system could arise, and the ones that could arise, the most unique arrangements of the particles in the system are the ones we bet on. This is also how thermodynamics works in physics. Exactly the same idea. Uh, there are a huge, uncountably large number of ways that the velocities of individual molecules in a gas uh, can be arranged. Uh, but the most plausible arrangement of them, the distribution of those velocities, turns out to be Gaussian. Uh, and you can appeal to some mathematical thing like the central limit theorem and, you know, addition of velocities like little billiard balls, and that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, but betting on it empirically is just this, because it could be anything. It's just the reason in nature you see Gaussian distributions, and I'm going to get to this a little bit later before you go, is because there are many, many more ways for real physical processes to end up in a Gaussian distribution than almost anything else. And that's why they appear. Uh, right? So it's like if you had 20 million pebbles and you threw them into this thing, they would be almost exactly equally distributed through the buckets. Uh, we'll get to the Gaussian. How do you get a Gaussian out of this? Hang on. Like, I think eight slides from now we're there. But we're going to go there. Are you guys with me, though, for the moment? Okay. This is like a revival for probability theory. That's what it is. I'm going to hallelujah in a moment. Uh, so uh, I really heard out on maximum entropy. This is what we're doing in maximum entropy, those of you who cut on. Uh, but OK. So now here's the trick with W. W, we define it from combinatorics. It's the number of distinct ways you can get any arrangement of the individual pebbles in the system. And uh, uh, here's a trick uh, that will relate this to some stuff you already know. It's convenient to work with the logarithm of this thing, because the it's a really big number. So let's say take the natural log of it, which will which will make it much more convenient to work with. Then we're working with exponents of the counts instead, orders of magnitude. The log of a count is the order of magnitude of that count, right? <coughs> and we divide by one over n uh, to just normalize it for the number of particles. And this thing uh, for large n. Uh, even for like a thousand, is approximately equal to that thing there. And there's a box in the book where I show you how to derive this if you're interested. Uh, and you, you guys have all the algebra skills to do it, trust me. And um, this may look vaguely like something you've seen before, but in case you don't quite see it yet, n sub i over n is the proportion of pebbles in each bucket. And this is a distribution. So in a distribution in which you have the proportion of events at each particular identity, what is that? That's a probability distribution. Because they all sum to 1. And this is entropy. Entropy, all it is, is the 1 over n log multiplicity of a distribution. That's all it is. It's a measure of the number of unique microarrangements of the system that can produce that distribution. And distributions with lots of different ways to be produced, big Ws, have big entropy. And big entropy is what we bet on when we want to be right. Does that make sense? So this is where information theory comes in. And entropy is the foundation of Bayesian inference. Uh, uh, and at least one of the philosophies to get you there. There are like six others that are also fun. But I like this one because it's just logical. You don't have to be superstitious. And you don't have to pretend it always has the answers. Uh, uh, but it's uniquely logically defined by the information you put in. This perspective on Bayesian statistics is largely, uh, not entirely, but largely due to Edwin James, pictured there as a young man when he was a naval officer. And he was later a professor of physics. Um, his most, uh, it's his book that was published posthumously in 2003, shown up there at the top. Um, and James uh, 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 defined this thing that we now call the maximum entropy principle, or max int, which is the distribution with the largest entropy is the distribution that is most consistent with our stated assumptions and assumes nothing else. Why? Because it can happen the largest number of ways according to our assumptions. If you bet on any other distribution, that implies that in your intuition, you have other information that you have not put into the model. Uh, and therefore, you should attend to that problem and think about putting it in the model. And then you'll get another maximum entropy distribution. But the distribution with the greatest entropy is the one to bet on. Now, what, you, what were you going to do with this? Well, I'll tell you in a moment. But does this make a little bit of sense right now? This is not intuitive uh, at all. Uh, and one of the things about that is our intuition well, intuition is just intuition. It's a, it's a guide to ideas, but it's not a way to test if something's right. Um, uh, uh, so if it doesn't feel in, uh, intuitive to you, you're just normal. Uh, but I'm going to try with some examples to help you understand what's going on here. What we're going to use this for is a way to construct likelihood distributions 
given knowledge about the outcome variable of interest. And that's what we're going to start doing next week. We'll give you some examples before you go today. Um, so for, uh, but all it's, it's classically used, and one of the ways that James originally used it was to construct prior distributions. If you have some information, uh, usually in the form of constraints, and I'll show you what that means in a second, uh, on a parameter before you've seen it, uh, you can choose a probability distribution that contains only that information and no other information. And what will that distribution be? It'll be the one with the highest entropy consistent with the constraints. Now that, that won't make sense yet because I we've only done unconstrained pebble tossing. We're going to do constrained pebble tossing in a moment. So hang on, as we'll do constrained pebble, pebble tossing uh, in a moment. Um, for observations, we use this to construct likelihoods. So what does that mean? We've got a variable. Before we see the actual data, we still know things about it. We know, for example, that it may be constrained to positive numbers because it's a distance or a duration. That's information. So if you want to choose a likelihood uh, a distribution for the data before you've seen the actual values, which is a good idea, uh, you can use entropy to do it. And what that guarantees is only the information you input into it will be embodied in the distribution you choose and no other. As it has, there are the largest number of ways to realize that distribution consistent with your assumptions. That is the constraints. Uh, and it turns out, as a special case, that all of Bayesian updating can be rediscovered this way as a special case of entropy maximization. The posterior distribution is the distribution with the, uh, so if you have a flat prior, the posterior distribution is the distribution with the largest entropy consistent with the data as a constraint. I'll say that again. Uh, if you have a flat prior, the posterior distribution is the, is the distribution with the largest entropy that is still consistent with the data as a constraint. And this will be a little confusing because we haven't done constraints yet. We're going to do those in the next slides. But that's true. If you don't have a flat prior, then you get something called minimum cross entropy. The posterior distribution has the minimum cross entropy. What does that mean? It means it's most like the prior distribution you can get by well, still being consistent with the new information you've added in. And that's what Bayesian updating does, because it's just counting, just like this. It's counting pebbles. Little imaginary quanta of probability, of possibility. Ways that you can draw marbles from a bag. And that's the unglamorous, as I say, basis of probability theory. It's just this, counting up stuff. Um, and then launching rockets based upon the advice you get from it, right? Uh, I think this is pretty cool. It turns, Bayesian inference is a special case of entropy maximization, not the reverse. Entropy maximization, not everything is data input. Uh, you can have constraints on moments of distributions, and that's information. So maximum entropy, or more broadly, minimum cross entropy, is a much larger domain of inference, of logical inference. Bayesian updating is just a special case where you're attending posterior distribution. Uh, that said, we're going to keep trucking with posterior distributions like we always have, but hopefully this will help you understand something more about what's going on. Uh, you with me so far? I've got more examples. So, uh, All right, let's take an example of putting in some constraints. Uh, well, we'll get there. First, we'll start with the uniform, and I want to show you what happens there. Um, so, ye olde information entropy, right? Remember this a couple weeks ago? You enjoyed this, right? Information entropy, Shannon, all that, yeah? Now what I've tried to show you is that this expression Really all it is, is an order of magnitude representation of the number of unique microarrangements that can give you the distribution. That's, that's what large entropy means. Entropy is a measure of the multiplicity of the distribution. Uh, and the distribution with the maximum entropy has the largest multiplicity of all the distributions that are possible. So we could ask, what kind of distribution will maximize information entropy? Uh, and it turns out the answer is, if you don't state any other kind of, kind of constraints, it's the flattest, well, in general, it's the flattest distribution still consistent with the constraints. Uh, if all the p's are equal, entropy will be maximized. Now, I'm going to show you some examples of this in a second. This is something you can prove uh, analytically. Um, uh, but I think I can give you the intuition for it uh, uh, on the next slide with some pictures. Um, and the reason is because that distribution can happen the most ways. So think about the buckets and the pebbles again. As it got more and more even, the multiplicity went up. There's more and more microarrangements of pebbles that will produce the same distribution across buckets. So the even, and then as soon as you're perfectly even, if you started stacking up pebbles on the end, the entropy would start going down again. The multiplicity would go down. Now I need buckets. I'm like hanging. Those of you watching at home, I'm doing buckets in the air uh, here. But uh, you got, does that make sense, what I'm saying? So the flat distribution has highest entropy always. Uh, but sometimes you're not allowed to have a flat distribution. Uh, we're going to deal with that in a couple of slides. Um, uh, but what if you do? Well, uh, for example, the easiest case to think about uh, is a case where the only constraint is that you're in an interval. So say we all we know about 
some variable is that it must be constrained between some values A, which is its minimum, and B, its maximum. And this defines what's called the uniform distribution, which you've been using as priors for sigma for a long time now. And uh, uh, in this case, um, if you have uh, any probability distribution bounded, continuous probability distribution bounded between A and B, the distribution with maximum entropy is a straight flat line. The uniform distribution has maximum entropy. The only information that goes into it are the bounds. Uh, and then this is the largest, this is the distribution derived the most unique ways uh, given a process that produces continuous uh, deviations in this interval. Um, so just showing you some examples at the bottom. Uh, this diagonal one has an entropy of minus 0.19. Entropies can be negative, by the way, for continuous distributions. It's something we haven't dealt with before, but that's fine. It's no big deal. Uh, bigger is still better. <laughs> right? And uh, the flat one has an entropy of zero. And um, uh, this curved one here has a, has a negative entropy as well. You can't get better than zero uh, in this interval. You just can't. I encourage you to try it home. Keep trying it for a while. Uh, it won't work. Uh, what if, and, and I think this is intuitive, right? Uh, I haven't given you any information by which to tell you that it's skewed or where the mean is. You don't know anything about that. So if you bet on it having any of that information in it, you're cheating. You've added information to the analysis. If you want to be consistent only with the state of constraints and only that and add nothing else, uh, entropy demands that you choose the flat distribution because uh, it has highest entropy, the largest number of ways to do it. It's the only distribution perfectly consistent with the constraints you stated at the start. Now, you may look at this and say, you know, I don't really think it's uniform, though. Well, that means you know something more. Now you want to add a constraint. So let's do that next. Let's add constraints to the distribution. Um, so again, think about our pebbles. Uh, again, same sort of situation. But now I'm going to let's put the buckets back down at the bottom. And let's imagine we have a lot more buckets. Uh, say, like, you know, how many of this is like 17 buckets here? <laughs> and uh, we're going to number them minus 8 to 8. Uh, we could do this, we could have a million buckets, right? Line them up. What are these? These are parameter values uh, or observable data values for an outcome variable. And uh, now let's imagine stating the constraint that we distribute, um, we can throw the pebbles, uh, a large number of pebbles into these buckets. It has an e they have an equal chance of landing in any particular bucket. Um, but we impose this constraint that when we count up the pebbles in each bucket, we compute the variance across buckets, right? Uh, and then that variance must equal 1. If it doesn't, we empty all the buckets out and do it again. So there's going to be a lot of pebble tossing, right? Thankfully, we have computers. Better yet, we have calculus <laughs> and combinatorics to do this for us. Uh, you don't want to actually do this. I, I think I make a joke in the book about if we can employ the entire country of Poland throwing pebbles for, you know, a millennium, uh, we could probably do this empirically. But Because the multiplicities are, are really hostile to doing this empirically. But... Um, now the question is, what would happen? So this is like saying there's a subset of all the distributions of pebbles that can arise. In that subset, variance equals 1, right? Uh, that is, we take the proportion of pebbles in each bucket. We've got a value for that bucket. We compute the variance across, of that distribution across those values. It's just like computing the variance of a posterior distribution, right? Same kind of operation or a prior. That's just an operation on the, on, on the random variable. Uh, the subset of pebble arrangements that has a variance of 1, those are the only ones we're considering now. We've thrown all the others away. Now, among the ones, these distributions that remain that have variance 1, which distribution has the highest multiplicity, has the highest entropy? And again, now that's the one we should bet on, because that's the one that can happen the most ways, consistent with this constraint that we've stated. Right? So if you have prior information that the variance is equal to some finite value, that's what we're interested in here, what is the distribution you get? Now, I know I can tell from the eyes, some of the eyes in the audience that some of you know the answer to this already. I think I've said it before in class. But the answer is a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it won't be perfectly Gaussian here because it's not perfectly continuous. But, you know, if you had 100 buckets, it'll be close enough for government work, right? Um, you know, and nature is quantized anyway. Real numbers are an illusion of mathematics. Right? And, uh, so here we revisit the Gaussian. Um, the constraints on the Gaussian is that it's an unbounded real values that can be anywhere from minus infinity to positive infinity, although it's almost always constrained to a pretty narrow interval uh, for high probability, um, and that it has a finite variance. Sometimes you can say you know it, like on the previous slide, you said the variance is 1, but even if you don't know it, all you know is that there is some finite variance, um, then what distribution maximizes entropy, which means can arise the largest number of ways? And the answer is the Gaussian. Just like on the soccer field with the coin flipping, 
back at the beginning of chapter 4, inevitably those collection of sums converge to a Gaussian. Inevitably. Was that magic? No. It did that because the, the, there are all these wandering paths on the soccer field. And they're, each of those has got its own little special snowflake history, yes. But the, the collective of them uh, is, is moving towards some distribution. And as you run the experiment long enough, they end up converging on the distribution that can happen vastly more ways than any other. And those distributions all look Gaussian. Now, they may not be exactly Gaussian, but they're so close to Gaussian you can't tell the difference. And that's because there are vastly, vastly, vastly more ways uh, to get something that looks bell-shaped by adding together random values than any other shape. And that's why gases have a distribution of velocities that's Gaussian. There's nothing magic about it. It's just that whatever does happen, the distribution that is realized, determined by the real deterministic physics of it, it's bound to be Gaussian because it's almost impossible for it to end up any other thing because there are orders and orders of magnitude more ways for the collective to be Gaussian than anything else. Right? And now our information, we could do better if we knew something more, but it turns out, isn't it great that being as ignorant as that, just knowing something about the entropy of the system and the constraints on it, you can predict what the collective looks like. And that's the value of maximum entropy. Is that it gives us a principal logical way to make that prediction without knowing the real physics of gas molecules. Okay? Uh, so uh, physically what's going on here is when you add up fluctuations from processes, the distribution of those sums converges to Gaussian. Again, it's not magic. It's just there are vastly more ways to realize the Gaussian shape than any other shape. And the Gaussian turns out to be, as you might suspect from this fact, the flattest distribution possible with the given variance. You can't squish it or stretch it or anything in any other way and increase the entropy. Uh, you just can't do it. And maintain the same variance, right? Among all continuous probability distributions with a given same variance, you can't change the shape from a Gaussian and increase the entropy. Uh, and it's because of this physical fact that there are just many, many more Microarrangements of the coin flips and the paths of the people on the soccer field that'll make a bell curve than anything else. Um, so what I've showed you in the upper right, uh, and I give you the expressions to generate this in the book, um, uh, the Gaussian distribution is shown in blue there, right? There's a bell curve in there. And then the other three distributions in black that I've shown are what are called generalized Gaussian distributions. They have different exponents uh, and normalizing constants that stretch them. So you can get something that looks like a Laplace distribution, right, that really peaked one. That's one extreme, all the way down to this thing that's really flat in the middle. I don't know what we call this, like a bunt cake pan, something, if anybody bakes anymore. I don't know, people just buy things from the freezer section, right? But it uh, kind of looks like a bunt cake to me, a bunt cake pan. But um, all of these distributions have the same variance. Uh, they do. Uh, but the flattest one, the one that distributes the probability most evenly, uh, across all of the possible parameter values and still has that variance is the blue one, the Gaussian. Uh, and that's why it has maximum entropy. Is that a little bit intuitive? It might be hard to see because, again, there's nothing actually intuitive about combinatorics, right, unless you're Paul Erdős or something like that. But uh, at the bottom I show you, you can plot across the shape parameter that adjusts across those distributions up there in the generalized Gaussian family. Um, when it's two, you're at the quadratic shape, which is the Gaussian. Remember this, the square in the Gaussian density function? And, that, and then I'm plotting on the vertical the entropy of the distribution with the given. All of these have exactly the same variance. As you adjust the shape of it, uh, entropy is maximized at exactly the Gaussian distribution, as I said. And what's the significance of that? Well, it just says this is the largest number of ways, given a set of assumptions, that that distribution has the largest number of ways it can arise. How many more? Vastly, vastly more. Remember how fast multiplicities went up? Uh, the reason gas molecules always arrange their velocities in a Gaussian distribution is because the multiplicity for that is vastly, vastly bigger. Not a little bit bigger. Vastly, vastly bigger than every other, every other collective shape. That's what's incredible about it. James called this the entropy concentration theorem. And it's just, it's really amazing how fast the combinatorics go up for large numbers of, say, gas molecules or coin flips or things like that. But there's no magic involved uh, at all. It's just multiplicities. Okay. Let's do another example. I have just enough time to do this before you guys go. Um, let's think about the binomial distribution again, which we're going to start working with in earnest next week. We're going to start doing logistic regression for reals, and you're going to love it, because uh, then we can get beyond Gaussian land and have some fun. Um, so let's reconsider the binomial distribution now. Uh, it is also a maximum entropy distribution, like the Gaussian, but for a different set of constraints. So again, buckets, uh, tens and thousand pebbles, 
And we're throwing them in. Sorry, Ted, you just sit there. That's all. That's why I keep referencing you. Sorry. It's a bad habit. I should, like, go over to this side. But uh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're fine with it? Okay. Sorry. And uh, uh, the constraints, now you're encouraging it. All right. No. So we throw, we throw uh, pebbles in there. I should use Paul because I'm paying him, so he can't resist. But uh, <laughs> um, we're throwing pebbles in the buckets. Uh, again, we're going to reject some distributions depending upon the constraints we impose. Um, the constraints on the binomial are that there are only binary outcomes are observable, and what we can observe are sums of binary outcomes. That's all we can observe, like numbers of blue marbles out of the bag. It's a binomial process. Uh, so if we've got any kind of, of process where only binary outcomes are possible, and the expected value across trials is the same. Another way to think about that is the probability of a 1 or a 0 is constant. Whatever it is, as long as it's constant across trials, then it turns out the distribution that maximizes entropy is the binomial. It doesn't have to be the right distribution, but if those are the only things you know about the outcome variable, which is often is true, then the only logically consistent choice for a likelihood function, and we'll, I'll reprise this on Tuesday next week, is the binomial. Any other choice of likelihood function means it implies other constraints that you haven't noticed, right? And they will affect inference, uh, but you don't know what they are. Uh, so this is also a way to police your assumptions. Uh, it's a great thing to do. What's nice about this is that this recovers all of the most commonly used likelihood distributions in statistics. It's just a different way to, to justify them. Usually they're justified because someone told you so, right? Why do you use a binomial distribution with logistic regression? Because that's what it is, because I told you so. Right? Uh, I'm trying to do better than that. I'm trying to say it's principled on logic. If all you want to use are the stated information that you state at the beginning of the problem, maximum entropy tells you the only logically consistent assumption for a distribution. Uh, uh, you may not like it once you realize what it is, but that means you knew something else and you hadn't realized it. Right? Um, so let me give you some examples of the binomial. I've got, I've got just enough time to do this justice, I think. Um, first, let's, let's get back to the flat issue. Uh, with some expected values as a constraint, you can get a flat binomial distribution. Um, and what you want to have to think about here is that back to marbles, uh, W for white marble, B for blue marble, four possible distributions of assignments. Uh, we're going to pull two marbles out of the bag. There are four possible events now. There's white, white, blue, white, white, blue, and blue, blue. And those are different events, right? It's different order. You don't care about them, but that's something you impose later. You just don't think order matters. Uh, so distribution A is even, and I picture it here, the flat distribution. Distribution B is, is uneven. It's got more probability in the tails. So I show it here. Uh, and then C and D. C is the flip of B, and D is the, uh, has more variance across the possible outcomes. All of these are possible, and they can happen if you draw marbles from the back, right? It could happen. Um, but A is the one with the highest entropy because it's the flattest. In fact, it's perfectly flat. You can't get flatter than that, right? And why the expected value across these two draws is equal in all of these distributions. If you count up uh, the expected, if you compute the expected value of distributions A, B, C, and D, they're all equal. Uh, they're all expecting one blue marble on average in two draws. I leave this as an exercise for the student. Actually, I show you the code in the book how to do it. Uh, so you should go run it. But they all have the same average count of blue marbles across the two trials. Guaranteed, they do. The same expected value. But one of them has the highest entropy, and that happens to be the flat one, which can be realized vastly many more ways than the others under the random process. So you bet on that. Not because it's bound to happen, not because magic tells us it is, but because logic insists that that's the only thing consistent with your assumptions. Or it's the thing most consistent with your assumptions. Make some sense? It's not guaranteed to work. right? Um, let's look at something a little bit more interesting uh, before I let you go. Uh, now let's use, let's use a different expected value. When you choose an expected value in two trials of two marbles from the bag, um, you can have an expected value of one blue marble. You expect one blue marble in two draws. And that will give you a flat distribution. But what if we choose something other than even? One means even, right? The probability of a blue marble is a half when the expected value is one. Well, imagine the probability of blue marble was something else, like say 0.7. And there were more blue marbles. And someone had told you this. This was your prior information from the factory. 70% of the marbles are blue. Okay, now the expected value is 1.4. Uh, this is a constraint, and we can solve for the maximum entropy distribution given that constraint, the expected value 1.4. Uh, I'm leaving a lot, aside a lot of the math here because usually these processes involve using something called a Lagrangian to, do a, uh, to solve for a distribution that maximizes a function. 
Some of you have had a couple of advanced calculus courses. You remember variational analysis, where you solve for functions and maximize the function. Right? Instead of solving for, you're used to using calculus to solve for values of a, a particular variable that maximize a function. Well, you can also solve for distributions that maximize a function. That sounds fun, right? Remember, the turtle's all the way down. <laughs> and uh, no, and it's great fun. And lots of important problems in biology are variational analysis problems like that. Maximum entropy is a problem like that because you're solving for the distribution that maximizes the entropy function. And there is a way to do that, and it usually involves something called the Lagrangian. Uh, and, but we're not going to do that. And uh, uh, there are boxes in the chapter where I give you another route to justifying these, proving these are maximum entry distributions. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and take a look at them. But um, you're, you're, you're an honest human being if you don't care, and you want to leave that aside. But uh, So let me show you kind of in the informal way what happens now. Um, we can, we can, what I've done here, and I give you all the code to do this in the book, we can simulate a very large number, I think I did 100,000 or something, distributions uh, over two draws of marbles that have expected value 1.4. That's the only constraint. Binary outcomes, two trials, expected value 1.4. I've simulated a bunch of them, uh, reject all the ones uh, that don't have expected value 1.4. You get a huge number of them. And I'm showing now what the plot in the lower left is, is the density of those distributions across their entropy for each of those realized distributions consistent with the constraints we can compute its entropy. And then I want to show you four examples from that. Uh, uh, so the first one, A, which has the highest entropy that was observed, is actually exactly the binomial distribution you would calculate from the binomial likelihood function with expected value 1.4. That is, if you plug in P.7, in two trials, you get that distribution. And that distribution has the biggest entropy of all the random ones that have been simulated here. Why? Because the binomial is the maximum entropy distribution for this. There's a box that proves this in the book. Um, here are some examples of others, if your curiosity. As we descend in entropy, going down this curve, notice there are lots of distributions really similar to it, too, that have high entropy. This is part of what we call entropy concentration. There are lots of neighboring distributions that are also really likely. And they also have high multiplicity. Uh, and they also have high entropy. Um, B uh, looks like this. It's less even, is what I want you to see. As we descend in entropy, the distributions get less even. This is uh, distribution A here, the binomial, is the most even distribution, the most even assignment across the different outcome possibilities uh, that is consistent with the stated constraint of its expected value being 1.4. C is even yet less, although this one, is, they get increasingly more beautiful, though, as they get un uneven, right? I kind of think they're nice as we descend in entropy, but... Unfortunately, they're unlikely. <laughs> and, uh, and then D, uh, D assigns almost zero uh, to this one outcome, and that's the reason it has such low entropy. Um, uh, does this make some sense? All I'm trying to give you is an intuition for the fact that these common distributions we work with in statistics, why use them? And the answer is because they, they're the distributions that are consistent with the stated constraints, and only that. Uh, under those stated constraints, Random processes will generate these distributions vastly many more ways than any other distribution. And that's why we use them, not because they're necessarily right in any sense. It all depends upon stated constraints, and your stated constraints could be wrong. Uh, so there's no magic involved here, but if you want to do this logically, uh, then we appeal to this as a way to choose distributions consistent with stated information. Um, and when you come back next week, uh, we're going to use this to justify uh, generalized linear models. Which will let us connect our linear model, right? Remember our geocentric model of how things are associated with an outcome, to some other kind of variable which has constraints like discrete outcomes can't be below zero. Uh, lots of data is like that, and we need to choose likelihood functions in that case. What can we appeal to? Maximum entropy is what we can appeal to. So, uh, with that, I'm going to leave you guys to go off and do your homework with Markov chains, and I'll see you on Tuesday.